Reading practice. Improve your pronunciation in English. Sunshine. Chapter 19. And Paolai had taken the early shift this morning. He'd offered. Okay. My little excursion through Nowaresville must have taken no time at all. One of the standard features of Nowaresville, maybe, that made a kind of sense, but you didn't really expect your very own alarming out-of-this-world experiences to align with the science fiction you'd read as a kid. The science fiction you'd outgrown in favor of Krista Hell and the Chalice of Death. My eyes wandered involuntarily to the gem-festooned goblet. I had to admit my reading had sort of prepared me for an overheated fantasy like this room. About now I rest feel I was on my own. Con didn't look as if he'd suffered any ill effects from his coma, or whatever it had been. I wondered what passed for a near-death experience in a vampire. A slightly misplaced stake. He'd been able to go out foraging, anyway, the bread and the apples were both fresh. I wouldn't have expected you to, choose to sit next to a fire, I said, at random. Sitting next to a fire seemed like the sort of thing only silly, show-offy vampires would do. Like human kids playing chicken in no town. He didn't say anything. Oh, good, we're playing that game again. I ate another apple. He raised his head and shook his hair back in an almost human gesture. Almost. We do not need heat as you do, he said and I expertly translated the we and you into vampires and humans. But we may enjoy it. Enjoy. I didn't enjoy thinking about vampires enjoying things. The things they tended to enjoy. I enjoy it, he said, and, surprising me enormously, added, it is the warmth of life and the heat of death. Life as defined by warmth to a chilly vampire. Death by burning, death by the sun. Or the original death of being turned. Maybe he had been harmed by his coma, it was making him introspective. As being bounced off walls appeared to be doing to me. I took a deep breath. I, I have had a, a feeling that all was not well with you, for some time, I said. I think it began the night you healed me. But it took me a while to, to figure out that that was what I was picking up. If I was. If you follow me. Yes, he said. He didn't say anything more for the length of time it took me to eat a fourth apple. Hey, they were small. Was it rude to eat, ah, uh, food, in front of a vampire? I'd done it before, of course. But if there was a future in congenial vampire-human relations there were grave, so to speak, etiquette questions to be addressed. Will you tell me what happened to you? I said, half irritated at the need, apparently, to drag it out of him, half astonished at my own desire to know. What was this, friendship? Big irony alert. Here we're both agonizing over this Carthaginian bond business and maybe it's only that we're learning to be friends. I could get into fireside sitting as the warmth of life too, probably. Hey, he was still a vampire and I was still a human and there was some other weird stuff, like transmuting and poisoned wounds and now harassville. 
not to mention going out in daylight. But if we were supposed to be friends, I was going to have to get used to the fact that he wasn't the chatty type. He said, musingly, as if he was listening to his own words as he spoke them, I was more wearied by the effort to heal your wound than I realized at once. I had not, you see, ever attempted anything similar before. As I told you, I had to invent certain aspects. Guess others. I am not accustomed to not knowing what I am doing. One of the advantages of very long life. Lots of time for practice. I was careless after I left you. I permitted myself to be preoccupied. I was sensed by one of Bo's gang. I needed to escape and not to let her trace you through me. Another maneuver I am unaccustomed to is protecting the whereabouts of a human. I had the feeling he was saying something more than, and they weren't going to get anything out of me other than my name, rank, and serial number. I wondered what a vampire address book would look like, would it have alignments rather than street numbers? What would an alignment index look like? Could one vampire steal another vampire's address book? The first one called for assistance, of course, and they were very persistent when they caught the trace of you on me as well. I eluded them eventually. It was not easy. I came here. As you found me. Naked in a dark empty stone room. Vampire convalescence gone wrong. You mean you had been like that over a month? You schmuck, why didn't you call me before? He looked up at me, and there was undeniably a faint smile on his face. It looked a little grotesque, but not too bad, considering. Nothing like as awful as his laugh, for example. It never occurred to me. I had said to Yolanda, vampires don't call humans, do they? He looked back at the fire. Even if it had, I do not think I would have done so. It would not have occurred to me that you could assist in any way. You called me. You called my name. Once. I wouldn't have found you if you hadn't. I heard you calling me. You asked me to answer you. I called you to call me. Yes. Sunshine, do you wish me to apologize again? I will if you desire it. I could not have rescued myself. I was too far away. But I heard you, and I could still answer. You came and brought the rest of me back with you. I am grateful. I thank you. That is not the way I would have chosen to leave this existence. The balance between us has tipped again. Oh, the hell with the damn balance, I said. What I'm thinking is, if you hadn't needed to protect me, it would have been a lot easier, right? I weaken you, don't I? Aside from your having got tired already bailing me out that night. With the blood of a doe. There were times, like now, when the feel of light and warmth was different too. Different like seeing in the dark was different, but differently different. Different in a way I knew didn't come from a vampire. Is this simple nowness of awareness some gift from her? For a moment there were three of me. There was the human me. 
there was my tree self. And my dear self. Surely we outnumbered the vampire self. We and, he said thoughtfully. I think your interpretation of weakness may be distorted. I am physically stronger than any human. I can go without sustenance for longer than any human. But you can derive sustenance from bread and apples, which I cannot. And you can walk under the sun, which I cannot. How do you define weakness? I was thinking about my experience of bringing the rest of him back. It was a little difficult not to think about comparative weakness when only one of you could fling the other one across a room and into a wall and you were the one that got flung. Okay, I was not going to pursue that line. I sighed. He had already told me he couldn't stand against Bo alone. Choosing me as an ally might have made more sense to me if getting calories out of bread and apples and going around in daylight had any discernible relevance to the issue. Where am I? I thought he looked puzzled. Another of those vampire senses are different moments, I suppose. This is my home, he said at last. You don't call it home, I said, interested. No. I might call it my earth place, perhaps. I spend my days here. I have done so for many years. Earth place? Then we are underground. Yes. What about the fireplace? He looked at me. Doesn't the smoke say someone's here? The smoke is not detectable in the human world. Oh. Vampires would hold a lot more than one-fifth of the global wealth if they patented a really good air filter. The cynical view of the voodoo wars is that the others had done us humans a favor, by killing enough of us off and thus lowering the level of industrial commerce to a point that we hadn't managed to commit species suicide by pollution yet, which we otherwise might well have. Even if they looked at it this way, which I doubted, this would not have been pure philanthropy. Demons and words. Whichever side of the alliance they'd been on, need most of the same things we do, and vampires, well. Maybe it depends on your definition of philanthropy. I looked around a little more. The only light was from the fire, and my dark vision was sort of half confounded by something about this place, maybe just the thundering excess. Still, I could see a lot, and it was all pretty bizarre. The fur I was wrapped up in appeared to be real fur, long and silky, in jagged black and white stripes. I couldn't think what animal it might be. Something that didn't exist, perhaps, till a vampire killed it. With the slinky black shirt and the bruises, I felt like something off the cover of this month's bondage and discipline exclusive. All I needed was ankle bracelets and a better haircut. The buttons on the back of the sofa I was lying on were tiny gargoyle faces, sticking their tongues out or poking their fingers up their noses. Every now and then they weren't faces at all, but pairs of buttocks. The sofa itself was some kind of purple plush velvet, except that the shadows it laid were lavender. Well, if I could travel through now I restville I suppose I shouldn't protest about shadows that were lighter than their source, or about furs from animals that didn't exist. My knowledge of natural history in black and white didn't extend much beyond skunks and zebras anyway. 
Maybe it did exist, whatever it was. The fur could have been dyed, but somehow this didn't suit my idea of vampire chic. Actually con didn't suit my idea of vampire chic. This hectic gothic sensibility was a surprise. Interesting decorating principles, I said. He glanced around briefly, as if reminding himself what was there. My master had a sense of the dramatic. I was riveted both by my master and had. As in used to have, as in dead, rather than undead. Your master? I said experimentally. This is his room. Silence fell. Con returned to staring motionlessly at the fire. So much for leading questions. I sighed again. Con, to my surprise, stirred. Do you wish to hear about my master? He said. Well, yes, I said. There was a pause, while he, what, organized his thoughts, decided what to leave out. He turned me, he said at last. I was not appreciative, but I was apt to his purpose. As there was no going back I agreed to do as he wished. Another pause, and he added, with one of those more expressionless than expressionless expressions, like his more than stillness immobility, a newly turned vampire is perhaps more vulnerable than you would guess. I was dependent on my master at first, whether I wished it or not, and I chose to let him teach me what I needed to know to survive. That was many years ago, when this was still the new world. Eek, I thought. Three or four hundred years ago, give or take a few decades, and depending on which old world explorers you are counting from. That can't be right, if he was that old, he shouldn't be able to go out in moonlight. He wished to rule here, when the Liberty Wars came, at least, unofficially. The standard human slang was below ground and above ground. Unofficially would be below ground, being the biggest, nastiest junkyard dog of the dark side. Officially would still be pretty unofficial, control another two-fifths of the world economy, presumably, and make our global council into a bit of window dressing. He might have succeeded, but he had bad luck, and a powerful and bitter enemy with better luck. There were not many of my master's soldiers left after the Liberty Wars. I was one. Much of my master's vitality left him with the ruin of his ambition. He turned collector instead. Those of his soldiers that had survived the walls left or were destroyed, one by one, till only I remained. When my master also was destroyed, I was left alone. I was glad of the warmth of the fire. Con's voice was low and, as ever, dispassionate, and I had no clue whether he'd been, you know fond of his master in any way, maybe after he'd got over being you and appreciative of having been turned. What purpose had Con been apt for? I was sure I didn't want to know. Good. One question that probably wouldn't get answered that I didn't have to ask. Why had Con stayed when everyone else left? I remembered him saying a month ago, there are different ways of being what we are. His master before the Liberty War sounded like your common or garden variety world takeover Odin vampire thug, and a powerful one at that. 
So why had Con stayed? Con who didn't even run a gang now. More questions not to ask for fear he would answer. But I didn't have much clue about the working range of vampire emotion. Bloodlust. What else? Other kinds of lust. Maybe it had been life lust earlier. No, I wasn't thinking about that. Did Con get over being unappreciative by getting over being able to feel appreciative? No, Con had just told me he was grateful for being rescued. But gratitude might be a human concept, applicable merely to a situation that demanded some kind of courtesy, as pragmatically meaningless as thank you. Well, at least he'd, hum, felt that courtesy was demanded. And then there was Bo. The inconvenient bond between Con and me that we were trying to, um, strengthen, without, um, intensity, was because of Bo's threat to both of us. I did not like where this thought was going. Your master's bitter enemy, was it Bo? No. Bo's master. Oh well that made it all better immediately. I stuffed a handful of fur in my mouth to stop myself from whimpering. Con looked up at me. Perhaps he thought the bread and apples hadn't been enough and I was still hungry. I destroyed his master. It's only Bo now. I bit down on the fur. Pardon me, I thought, if I don't find this information overwhelmingly reassuring. Only Bo. And his gang, which had chained Con up in a house by a lake not too long ago from which he escaped only by a very curious chance. Con might not fall for that one again but no doubt there were other possibilities. Bo could be assumed to be the resourceful kind of evil fiend. Another of those possibilities had almost got Con a month ago, for example. Why didn't Con want to post an ad in the sucker personals, there had to be hidden vampire zones on the globe net asking for his old comrades in arms to return for a bit and give him a hand? He could pass out the contents of his master's old room as reward, since he didn't seem too interested in them. If those were real gemstones in my absurd goblet, it was probably worth the national debt of a medium-sized country. Why didn't he just run a gang, like a normal vampire of his age? Who should have to because he couldn't go out in moonlight anymore? There were so many questions I didn't want to know the answers to. I pulled the fold of fur back out of my mouth again, and tried to smooth it down. Teeth marks, not to mention spit, probably lowered its value. I felt horribly tired, and alone, despite my companion. Especially because of my companion. I picked up the goblet again, it nearly took two hands, two hands would certainly have been easier, I was just resisting the idea of needing two hands, and teetered it toward my mouth. As it had seemed a long time before the wine hit the bottom pouring it in, it seemed rather a while before it touched my lips, tipping it back out. Drinking straight from the bottle, however, didn't seem like an option. Not in this room. In Con's room maybe the empty one with no furniture. And no fire. I, I wanted mountains of dough to turn into cinnamon rolls and bread, I wanted an unexpected tour group on a day we're short of kitchen staff, I wanted a big dinner party to ask for cherry tarts, 
I wanted to curl up on my balcony with a stack of books and a pot of tea. I wanted Mel's warm, tattooed arm around me and daylight on my face. I wanted to go home. I wanted my life back. I had been here before. I had once had all that, and I drove out to the lake one night to get away from it. What is this thing, anyway? I said, heaving the goblet up. I conceded, and used two hands. It could be a loving cup. First prize in Vampire League sports. You didn't fill it with champagne, of course, you cut off the heads of the losing team and poured their blood in. Champagne later maybe when they ran out of the hard stuff. It is a cup of souls from the ceremony of gathering at Oran Hallow. What? I put it down hastily. Just stop asking questions, sunshine. No wonder it goddamn tingled against my goddamn hand. Nobody knows where Oran Hallow is. Well, nobody who knows is telling the rest of us. It's not a big issue on the dark line but it is one of the things that keeps coming up. Among the people who think it exists somewhere you could describe by latitude and longitude, none of the plausible guesses are anywhere near New Arcadia. But there isn't any consensus on whether it is a geographic place or merely a part of the right. It is a big magic handler's right, done by clan. The blazes probably knew how, and where, to do it, but I didn't. I didn't know anything about cups of souls or ceremonies of gathering, but I didn't want to. It is one of the few articles in this room that my master was given, said Con usually there was some constraint involved. I bet there was. Why would a magic handler clan want to give something like this to a master vampire? Especially a master vampire. It was not freely given, Con said after another of his pauses. But it was offered and accepted as payment for a task he had undertaken that was to their mutual benefit. There was some choice about the conclusion to this task. This reward was proposed as persuasion to make one choice instead of another. The cup carries no taint that might distress you. And your gracious dining accessories don't run to wine glasses from Boutique Central. Then why does it buzz against my skin? I said crossly. Perhaps because it was the Blaze clan that possessed it, said Con. I jumped off the sofa, staggered, bumped into the little table, and heard the goblet crash to the floor as I ran off into the darkness. I didn't get far, Con's master had been a very enterprising collector, and I wasn't up to the weaving and zigzagging to make my way through the spoils. I collided with something that might have been an ottoman almost at once, and hit the floor even harder than the goblet had, although I didn't spill. Further note on vampire emotions, if any, don't expect a vampire to understand the turbulence of human family ties, including broken ones, or maybe it's that vampires don't get it about cowardice, and how a good sound human reaction to unwelcome news is to try and run away from it. I picked myself up. More bruises. Oh good. It wasn't going to be a mere matter of high neck t-shirts this time, I was going to need an all over bodysuit plus a bag over my head. I turned around slowly, balancing myself against some great felled spasm of plaster that might have counted, in these surroundings, as an ionic pillar.
Con was standing up, facing me, his back to the fire, haloed by its light. Maybe it was my state of mind, but he suddenly looked far larger and more ominous than he had since before I knew his name. I couldn't see his face, maybe my dark vision had been further unsettled by my fall, but there was something wrong about his silhouette against the firelight, something wrong about him being surrounded by light at all. I remembered what I had thought that first time, by the lake, predatory, alien. He wasn't con, he was a vampire, inscrutable and deadly. I made my way back toward the fire. I don't know if I wanted to reclaim Con as my ally, if not my friend, or if it was that there was no point in running away. I had to pass very close to him to reach the fire, there was only one gap among all the arcane bric-a-brac that would let me through. I knelt on the hearthrug, at least there was a hearthrug, even if the hairy fanged head at one end of it didn't bear close examination and held my hands out toward the fire. It felt like a real fire. More important, it smelled like a real fire, and when I leaned too close the smoke made my eyes sting. It spat like a real fire too, and since there was no fire god a spark fell onto the hearthrug. I glanced down, the hearthrug was unexpectedly unprepossessing, the fur short and brownish and patchy, having had sparks fly into it before. A few new burns wouldn't ruin its looks because it didn't have any. I felt hearthrugish. I'd never worried about my looks much, I had always had other things to worry about like making cinnamon rolls and getting enough sleep. But I was beginning to feel rather too burn-marked. Like I'd been lying too near a fire with no fire guard. Did I hear him sit down near me? You don't hear a vampire coming, I knew this by experience. But this wasn't any vampire, this was Con. I'd already promised to help him, if I could, because I needed his help. No. I hadn't promised. But it didn't matter. The bond was there. I hadn't ratified any contract, I'd woken up one morning to discover fine print and subclauses stamped all over my body. If I wanted a signature, it was the crescent scar on my breast. It meant I heard him coming even when I didn't hear him coming. I waited a moment longer before I turned to look at him. Vampire. Dangerous. Unknowable. Seriously creepy. This one's name was Constantine. We'd met before. Well, what do we do now? I said. I take you home, said Con. Okay, that's today. What about tonight? Tomorrow? I said. We must find Bo. My stomach cramped. Maybe it was just the apples. I also had to learn that shilly-shallying was not a vampire gift. I wondered if I could teach him to say perhaps and not before next week. I knew this wasn't going to be a matter of loading up on apple tree steaks, or table knives, and knocking on Bo's front door. You don't know where he, are. Uh, lives. No. I had only begun to search, since our meeting by the lake. He is well defended and well garrisoned. I glanced up at the invisible ceiling. Given the furnishings the ceiling was probably phenomenal. 
or antiphenomenal, like Medusa's head or the eye of a basilisk. I hope you are better defended, I said. I hope so too. I didn't like hearing a vampire talk about hope. My master specially collected things that defend, or could be turned to defense. He felt that his attempt to win what he desired by aggression had failed, and he wished his subsequent seclusion to be uninterrupted. Gargoyles and Thochochks, the vampire arsenal. I have always preferred solitude, and have improved on his arrangements. I have some reason to believe that if I never left this place no one would be able to come to me. You are forgetting the road through now Arresville, I said. Feelingly. I am not forgetting, he said. I am assailable by you in a way I am assailable to no one and nothing else. Sunshine. Chapter 20 Assailable An interesting choice of adjective. I looked up at him, and he looked down at me. I couldn't see into the shadows on his face. They remained shadows. They didn't wiggle or sparkle and they didn't have red edges. They didn't go down a long way. They were just shadows. Cute. The only person who still looked normal out of my eyes wasn't a person and wasn't normal. The look between us lengthened. He might not be able to lure me to the same doom he almost had the second night at the lake, but it seemed to me it was still doom I saw in his eyes. I looked away. Improvements, I said. You mean some of this, this, the phrases that occurred to me were not tactful, this tragic reproduction of William Beckford's front parlour, or perhaps Ludwig Tuss. You mean some of this, ah, uh, stuff is, ah, uh, yours. Nothing you may see, no. I do not like tying up my strength in objects. It was an old argument with my master. Physical shape has a certain durability that the less tangible lacks, but I feel it is a brittle durability. He believed otherwise. And he's the one who got skegged, I thought. Do you know what Bo's philosophy of, ah, uh, defense is? Pause. Finally, he said, he puts most of his energies into his gang. This will not help us locate him. I sighed. This is another of those vampire senses are different things, isn't it? I supposed I had to tell him what I'd found through the globe net, how I'd first found the bad now Arresville, the beyond dark human squishing space and what else seemed to be in there. If in was the right preposition. Out. On. Up. With. After. Over. English has too many prepositions. Did I have to mention SOF? I didn't have to tell him anything yet. He didn't seem to be in a big hurry to get me home. How close, in ordinary human-measured geography, was this earth place to Yolanda's house? Ally or no ally, I didn't like the idea of our being neighbors. Bo isn't his real name, is it? I said. It sounds like something you'd call a sheepdog. It is short for Beauregard. I laughed. I hadn't known I had a laugh available. A vampire named Beauregard. It was too perfect. 
And he probably hadn't got it accidentally from his stepdad who ran a coffee house. How much time do we have? I said. Bo, I mean, not today's dawn. I was beginning to learn when he was thinking and when he was merely thinking about what to say to me, a bumptious human. This time he was thinking. I have been out of context since we last met, he said. Yes, he said context. I do not know. I will find out. Same time, same place, I murmured. Not. I do not understand. We have to meet again, right? I said. And I have things to tell you too. I may have a, a kind of line on bow myself. He nodded. I didn't know whether to be flattered or outraged. Maybe he thought he'd chosen his confederate well. Equal partners with a vampire, an exhilarating concept. Supposing you lived long enough to enjoy the buzz. But I guess hey, well done, congratulations, while weren't in common vampire usage. Maybe I could teach him that too, with probably a not before next week. I will come to you, if I may, he said. You would rather I didn't come here again. I hadn't meant to say that either, but it popped out. A clear trace of surprise showed on his face for about a third of a second. I wouldn't have seen it if I hadn't been looking straight at him, but it was there. You may come here if you wish. I... He stopped. I could guess what he was thinking. It was the same thing I was thinking. Wasn't thinking. Come. I will give you a token. He slid easily through the gap in the impedimenta. Sorry, this household brought out the worst in my vocabulary. It was like every bad novel and hyperbolic myth I'd ever read crowding round to haunt me in three dimensions and made off into the dark. I had a sidelong peek at the overturned goblet as I passed it. My dark vision steadied if I kept it on Con's back, so I did, mostly, resisting the compelling desire to try to figure out what some of the more tortured blacknesses indicated by looking at them directly, hydras with interminable heads, laocoon with several dozen suns and twice as many serpents, and infestations of trifolds, the entire chariot race from ben -Ha all frozen in plaster or wood or stone. I hoped. Especially the trifolds. Con stopped at a cupboard. It had curlicues leaping out of its lid like a forest of satyr's horns, and something, things, like satyrs themselves oiling down the edges. It was satyrs. Their hands were its handles. Ah. Con, his own hand on one of the doors, glanced at me. Why did the cup distress you? I shrugged. How was I going to explain? My question is not an idle one, he said. I do not wish to distress you. Not till after we'd defeated Mr. Bojangles anyway. Oh, sunshine, give a vampire a break. He probably thinks he's trying. I'm not sure I can explain, I said. I'm not sure I can explain to me. And vampires aren't much into family ties, are they? No, he said. I already knew vampires aren't great on irony.
I have got into this because of my inheritance on my father's side. I'm certainly alive to tell about it so far on account of that inheritance, right? But I looked into his face as I said this, and decided that the standard impassivity was at the soft, understanding end of the range, like marble is a little softer than adamant. I'm a little twitchy about this bond thing with you, and the idea of, of a kind of background to it that your master had dealings with my dad's family I don't like it. I didn't want to know that the monster that lived under your bed when you were a kid not only really is there but used to have a few beers with your dad. And the only training I've ever had, if you want to call it training, was a few hours changing flowers into feathers and back with my gran 15 years ago, and I feel a little, well, exposed. Unready. I could maybe have said, assailable. I see. Con stared at the ugly door for a moment as if making up his mind, and then opened it. Inside were rows and rows of tiny drawers. I could feel the, well, it wasn't heat, and it wasn't a smell, and it wasn't tiny voices, but it was a little like all three together. There were dozens of things in those drawers and not an inert one in the lot. They were all yelling secreting radiating a kind of M.E. Me. 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 Like the jock kids in school when the coach is choosing teams. I wondered what the cupboard was made of. I didn't feel like touching it myself and seeing if it might tell me anything. I didn't like the grins on the faces of the satyrs. Con opened a drawer and lifted out a thin chain. The other voices' emissions subsided at once some of them with a distinct grumble, or fart. The chain glimmered in the non-light, the foxy-colored light of the fire didn't reach this far, it looked like opal, if there was a way to make flexible connecting loops out of opal. It was humming a kind of thin fey almost tune, my mind, or my ear, kept trying to turn it into a melody, but it wouldn't quite go. Con poured it from one palm to the other, it looked fine as cobweb in his big hands, and then held it up again, spreading his fingers so that it hung in a near circle. The almost tune began to change. It would catch, like a tiny flaw tripping a recording, making it hesitate and skip, but each time it picked up again the tune had changed. It did this over and over as I listened, as Con held it up, and as I listened the strange, wavering non-tune. Seemed to grow increasingly familiar, as if it were a noise like the purr of a refrigerator or the high faint whine of a TV with the sound turned off. Familiar. Comfortable. Safe. I also felt, eerily, that the sound was becoming more familiar because it was somehow trying to become familiar, like the shape of a stranger at the other end of the street becomes your old friend so-and-so as it gets close enough for you to see their face and possibly that ratty old coat they should have thrown out years ago. This Sibylline chain was approaching me and dressing itself up as an old friend. It knew its job. By the time it drifted off into silence I was reaching for it as if it belonged to me. Which maybe it did. Con dropped it over my hands and it seemed to stroke my skin as it slid down my fingers. I watched it gleaming for a moment, the gleam seemed to have a rhythm, like a heartbeat, and then I dropped it over my head. It disappeared under the collar of the black shirt, but I felt it lying against me, crossing the tips of the scar below my collarbones, resting in a curve over my heart. Thank you, I said, 
falteringly. I knew a powerful piece of magic when I saw it and hung it round my neck, but I had never heard of anything quite like this, convergence, usually you had to make a terrific effort to match things up even a quarter so well as this. Of course what I didn't know about magic handling would fill libraries. Also, thank you seemed about as pathetic a response to such a marvel as anyone could make. I thought it would be glad to go to you. Er, uh, didn't you? No. My master was vexed when he discovered the necklet would not work for him nor any of our kind. This cupboard contains some of his other disappointments. There was a bit of a clamour when you opened the doors, I said. Yes. These are human things, and they have seen no humans since they were brought here. Pause. They do not love being idle. Some of them are very powerful. I can restrain them, even if I cannot use them. I would offer them to you, if... If there was any indication I wouldn't make a total botch, I interrupted which there isn't. To the contrary, if anything. The question of the existence of my demon taint, never far from the front of my mind these days despite serious competition from vampires and immediate death, resurfaced long enough to register that the human things had responded to me as human. Well, if they were comparing me to Con I was a shoe-in. I didn't know how long they'd been here, but a good guess was long enough to make them desperate. I touched the chain with my finger, and half thought, half imagined I heard a faint, the faintest of faint hums. If I was going to say I'd heard it, I'd say it was a happy hum. But I wasn't going to say I'd heard it. The cup was my mistake. Allow me to point out that it had been a rather tiring evening already, I said testily, before I met the dam, cauldron. And I wasn't exactly prepared. Nor was I exactly introduced. Even a master handler, which I am not, can be caught off guard. The necklet will allow you to find your way back here, said Connie May if you wish, investigate these things further, having prepared yourself. I laughed a small dry croaking laugh. That kind of preparation takes decades of apprenticeship. Ruthless, single-minded, hair-raising apprenticeship. It also requires someone to be apprenticed to, which in my case I have not got besides being at least 15 years too old to start, and possibly calamitously part blood. After a pause, Con said, I too had to invent much of my apprenticeship. A master with whom you cannot agree is sometimes worse than no master. Then why did you stay? I thought. There are few. I think, master handlers, who could have travelled the way you travelled this evening to come here, and lived. My capacity for invention is flash-hot stark, I thought. Sucker sunshade. Disembodied radar reconnaissance. Not to mention bitter chocolate death and killer zebras. Pity about the rest of me. If you will accept advice from me I would suggest you not come that way again, except in direst need. Happy to promise that one, I said. But don't find yourself in direst need again either, okay? Or even plain old bland low-level semisub dire need. Ah. No, said Con I will promise as well. 
to the extent it is within my mandate. He closed the cupboard. I thought, if I do get back here, for my first trick I'm going to transfer all that stuff out of that deeply repulsive cupboard, which I'm sure isn't making any of it rest any easier. Supposing I can find anything more suitable in this Baroque funhouse. We must be on our way. Dawn is a bare hour away. An hour? I said. You mean you're this is that close to? My dismay was hardly flattering, but Con answered with his usual detachment, not in human geography. But the fact that you are here at all, by the way you came, and the necklet you now wear, you will be able to walk some of my shorter ways. My heart sank. You just told me not to use Nahiresville again. Con said, I cannot travel that road any more than I can walk under the sun. I do not take you that way. Oh, I said. Well. I don't know how we came out above ground again, out into the ordinary night with a little ordinary breeze and a few ordinary bats swishing about. Bats. How quaint. I noticed they did not come from where we had come from, however. Wherever that was. I don't seem to recall coming out, like from a tunnel, the wilder, intenser darkness of Con's earth place merely thinned and crumbled and eventually we were walking on rough grass and turf. With bats skating overhead. I was uncomfortably reminded of my perfunctory clothing when the breeze showed a tendency to billow up inside the long black shirt, but I was so grateful to be breathing fresh air and because I desperately wanted to be home, when Con took my hand I didn't instantly jerk it away from him again. At least he didn't offer to carry me. Even though I was barefoot again. It occurred to me that I had a pattern of being inappropriately dressed during my associations with Con. His shorter way was a little like stepping on stepping stones while the torrent foamed around your feet, in this case the torrent of that conventional reality I was so eager to return to and threatening at any moment to surge over the edge and sweep you away. I almost certainly would have lost my balance without his hand, you had to look down to see where to put your feet and reality careering past at Mach 112 is seriously dizzy-making, plus some of the stepping stones were dangerously slick, disconcertingly like ordinary stones in an ordinary stream, although I didn't want to think what they were slick with, nor what the equivalent of getting soaking wet might be if I fell off. It was less unnerving than the way I'd gone earlier tonight as that way was less unnerving than where Emil's cosmail had taken me, but it was still unnerving. Very. I wondered if travelling through now Aresville was part of the you will begin, now, I think, to read those lines of, power, governance, sorcery, as I can read them, that Con had predicted a month ago. But he'd said red. If this was reading I didn't want to know about doing. Then the stones seemed to get bigger and bigger and the torrent slowed and grew calm, and we were at the edge of Yolanda's garden. I didn't notice him leave. I don't remember his dropping my hand. But as I recognized the shape of the house in the near light of Monday night under the open sky, I realized I was alone. I remembered as I staggered up the porch steps, trying to avoid the creakiest ones, that I didn't have the key to my apartment. Again. 
At this rate I should start keeping a spare under the flower pot for those nights I found myself doing something strange with Conwell barefoot and unsuitably clothed. Maybe it was the necklet, but I put my hand over the keyhole and growled something, I don't know what, and heard the damn bolt click open. I also heard tiny ward voices chittering at me irritably, but they didn't try to stop me coming in. I rebolted the door tidily behind me. I didn't take his shirt off. I fell onto my bed and was asleep instantly. I half expected to wake up and find myself lying in a little pile of ashes when the black vampire shirt disintegrated under the touch of the sun's rays. I more than half expected to wake up having had long, labyrinthine dream about Con with a background to match labyrinthine, I mean. No again. Although I remembered when I'd last woken up in my bed and hoped that what I remembered about something strange with Con had only been an embarrassing dream. It hadn't been a dream that time either, and the things that weren't tea dreams were by this showing getting more embarrassing. Speaking of patterns, I wanted to break soon. I did wake stiff as a plank from all my new scrapes and bruises, and with a crick in my neck so severe I wasn't sure I was ever going to get my face facing frontward again. I looked over my shoulder at the little heap of abandoned clothing in front of the still open balcony door as I stumbled into the bathroom and started running hot water for a bath. I'd been here before too, only last time it was the other vampires that had knocked me around. Be fair, I thought. I'm in a lot better shape than I was when I got home four and a half months ago. I didn't feel like being fair. For just a moment, four fewer than the ten seconds it had lasted when it happened I remembered his mouth on mine, his naked body hot and sweating against mine. No. I put my head under the tap and let the water blast all such thoughts away. My hair needed shampooing anyway. The shirt, although it needed a wash, still looked pretty glamorous in daylight. Good quality material. Nice drape. Even if black wasn't my color. Although at the moment a lot of me was dark blue and purple, and it coordinated very well with that. I scowled at the mirror. My own fault for looking. The chain round my neck gleamed in daylight too. It looked more like gold this morning, but if I stirred it with a finger it had a queer iridescent quality not at all like real gold not that I had much acquaintance with the stuff. I had always favoured plastic and rhinestones. I took the shirt off carefully and put it with the other laundry. Was it natural fibres, I wondered, did it need to be dry cleaned? I had somehow neglected to ask Con about these crucial details. Borrowing shirts from ordinary guys wasn't this complicated. For one thing, ordinary guy shirts usually had washing instruction tags in them. This one didn't have any tags. I took my bath and wondered if I was going to make it into the coffee house for the lunch shift. I wasn't anything like as bad off as I had been last spring. I was just sulky. I only took one bath. By the time the water had cooled from scalding to merely hot I could almost turn my head again. I left the rainbow chain round my neck during my bath. I didn't want to take it off somehow, and I doubted that bubble bath was going to tarnish it. What I did do was introduce it to my other talismans. 
I hadn't a clue how to clean up after last night's magic none of the words my gran had taught me seemed at all suitable. I felt kind of put off candles and herbs, and I wasn't in a very thank you mood. But I knew I should be doing something. This was a compromise. As a solemn rite it wasn't much. I was cross-legged on the very rucked up sheets of my bed, and still dripping from the bath, wrapped in an assortment of towels. I had pulled my little knife from the pants pocket of the trousers on the floor, and took the mysterious seal out of the bed table drawer. I smoothed a bit of pillow and laid them there. Then, gently, I lifted the chain off over my head, and dropped it down around them. I don't know what I was expecting. It just seemed like the thing to do. Knife, meat necklace. Seal, meat necklace. Necklace, meat knife and seal. I suspect we are going into some kind of fracas together, and that you are my co-conspirators, you and the underground guy, and I want to make sure you're all on speaking terms with one another before I ask you to guard my back. Or something. It was too late in the year for direct sunlight to touch my pillow at that time of day. So I don't know what happened. But there was a flash like, well, like a ray of sunshine, but it was some ray, like a golden sword, like a Christian saint's vision of glory. It landed on my talismans with an almost audible wump, like the king's grip had slipped and he'd clobbered the knight on the shoulder instead of merely tapping gently and dubbing him surfing. And the pillow caught fire. I sat there with steam suddenly boiling off my wet towels, my mouth open, staring. And my brain had gone on vacation without advance warning, because I reached into the fire, closed my hands around my three talismans, gathered them together, and pulled them out of the fire. The fire went out. The pillow lay there, charred and smoking. My hands felt a little hot. No big deal. When I opened my hands there were three overlapping red marks on the palms, one long thin almost rectangular oval, for the knife, one smaller shorter fatter oval for the seal, and a scarlet curl over the ball of one thumb a slightly ragged thread with stripe, for the chain. None of the objects themselves now felt any more than human body temperature warm. None of them looked a trace different than they had a minute before. Before they had been set on fire by persons or forces unknown. Oh, I said. My voice quavered. Oh my. I made it in for the lunch shift all right. I didn't want to stay home alone with myself. I hung the chain round my neck again, and put the knife and the seal in two separate pockets. I didn't feel like leaving anything in the bed table drawer anymore. We'd bonded or something, speaking of weird bonds. Our affiliation had been confirmed by setting one pillow on fire. I put the pillow in the trash and the sheets in the washing machine. My sheets had never been so clean as they'd been in the last few months. I hardly got them on again before something else happened and I was feverishly ripping them off and stuffing them in the wash with double amounts of soap and all the extra buttons pushed. Extra wash, extra rinse, extra water, extra spin, extra protection against things that go bump in the night. Unfortunately I never could find that last button. Some day soon I'd buy another pillow and a new set of pillowcases. 
Turned out once I was dressed in long sleeves and a high neck and jeans you didn't see the bruises much. There was one on my jawline that was going to be visible as soon as I tied my hair back and a gouge down my forearm that I decided I had to put a bandage on even if this made it look worse than it was. Couldn't be helped. You can't ease in a public bakery any more than you can cook anything without rolling your sleeves up first. I'd worry what to tell Mel later. Pal I was glad to see me. It had been a busy morning, but then it was always a busy morning. We're full up with SOFs, he said. I grunted. I'd seen them on the way in, glancing through the door to the front, having thoughtfully come in the sideway for staff only, and hungry derelicts, just in case of things like SOFs. I put a clean apron on and tied my hair up at lightning speed, lightning bolt, golden sword, Mac 112, threw a little flower in my face to camouflage the bruise on my jaw, and was up to my elbows in pastry by the time Pat had drifted apparently aimlessly into the bakery. I hadn't seen him on my way in, He'd been moving pretty fast himself if they'd called him over from HQ, a word with you on your next break, he said. I've only just got here, I said, smudging flour and butter and confectioner's sugar together briskly. Whenever, he said, loitering. It'll be a couple of hours, I said quellingly. I could feel Paoli raising his eyebrows behind my back, Pat was usually a friend with privileges. That had been before I'd found out my loyalties were not merely divided, they had hacked me in two and were disappearing over the horizon in opposite directions. Whatever you say, he said, saluting, although not very convincingly. I don't suppose there are any cinnamon rolls left. No, I said. Walnut sticky bun, said Powai. Blueberry muffin, pumpkin muffin, orange, carrot and oat muffin, pear gingerbread, honey cake. One of each, said Pat, and disappeared. Pal I hadn't been with us long enough yet to pretend to be impervious to the sincere flattery of people gorging themselves on the stuff you had made. He rubbed his face with a sugary hand to disguise the grin and went off to load up a plate and shout for Mary to take it out front. I was tempted not to admit when I went on break that I was having to do enough lying just plugging through my days and nights and didn't want to get too used to it. It was like I didn't want to forget the difference between daylight and nighttime, and both my funny eyes and my funny new life and undead style seemed to be prodding me relentlessly in that direction. Not funny. My sunshine self. My tree self. My dear self. Didn't we outnumber the dark self? My hands patted the two pockets that contained the knife and the seal, leaving two more smudges on my apron. I took the apron off and washed my hands and made myself a cup of tea and went out front. Pat had either come back or was still there. Paulie's piled up plate two and a half hours ago hadn't been enough. He was now eating lemon lust pastry bars and killer zebras. Any normal human ought to have a gut he'd have to carry around on a wheelbarrow, the way he ate. This had crossed my mind once or twice before, being many years acquainted with Pat's eating habits, but he was SOF, you know. So he got a lot of exercise and had a high metabolism rate. I wondered again what kind of demon he was. 
If he was a rubber foot, which came in blue sometimes, he could walk up walls, for example, which must burn a lot of calories. I nodded to him and went out to sit on the wall of Mrs. Bialowski's flower bed. The sun was shining. He followed me. Listen to the news last night, he said.